All right, we have the quorum, so we're going to go ahead and uh, get started. I'll call this meeting to order, and if we do, roll call, please. Councilmember Jimenez? Here. Councilmember Perales? Here. Councilmember Carrasco? Councilmember Jones? Councilmember Arenas? Do we have a quorum? Thank you. We have no items um, listed to be added or dropped. Um, and nothing on consent. Um, so unless there is any recommended uh, items for the work plan for my colleagues, we can go down to the uh, reports to the committee. All right, hearing none, we'll go down to item D1, our police department operation and performance by monthly status report. Lieutenant. That was very quick, thank you. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, my name is Paul Cook. I'm the Lieutenant in Command of the San Jose Police Department's Research and Development Unit, and I'm here this afternoon to present the Department's bi-monthly operations and performance status report. As usual, uh, we're going to begin with citywide crime statistics. And when we look at the crime statistics, you're going to see some interesting numbers in the burglary area. So we'll talk about that in our trends. Uh, it's, it's, it's timely because our burglary prevention unit is a year old this month, and we think that there may be some correlation there. Uh, under emerging issues, we're going to discuss the justice assistance grant from the Department of Justice, and then we'll follow up and wrap up with questions. So if we look at our, our reported part one UCR crimes, we're going to compare January to July of 2018 and 2019. You'll see, for instance, that homicides in 2018 were 31% lower than they were in 2019. But if we compare that to the five-year average, you'll see that actually 2019 is tracking along the five-year average, and it was 2018 that was unusually low. Our, our rape numbers continue to rise. The committee and the department and the council as a whole have been doing a lot of work on that this year. We still have a, a uh, special meeting scheduled and an informational memo coming out shortly, so I'll, I'll leave the discussion for that to those opportunities. Uh, robberies are down 12% this year over last. Um, and, but you'll see that our numbers compared to the five-year average are, are tracking closer to the five-year average this year. Aggravated assaults continue to rise. The department has been working on that for some time, developing strategies. Uh, we're going to continue to try to deal with that rise in aggravated assault. Overall, violent crimes are up 7.2% this year over the same time last year. And when considering um, property crimes, burglary is down. Again, we'll talk about that in the next few slides. Larceny is up uh, both over last year and over the five-year average. And vehicle thefts are significantly down over last year. In fact, they're also down over the five-year average, so we think that's a significant uh, benefit there. Property crimes are down 4.3. And in total, all of our UCR Part 1 crimes are down 2.7% this year over the same time last. So if we talk about burglaries, uh, I'm going to start with this slide where we just show the general trend for the last 20 years. And we've seen a, a, just a steady increase in burglaries over the last two decades. And in 2018, this is part of what motivated the chief of police to establish a new unit uh, called the Burglary Prevention Unit, uh, whose objective is to do proactive things to try to reduce burglary in our community. They've been at it for about a year. And I want to talk about some of the things that they've been doing. So they really approach this from two angles. They approach this from a preventative angle and from an investigative angle. Uh, from an example of prevention is they, they use the crime data information looking at commercial burglaries, for example, and noted that our several self-storage facilities were victims multiple times, resulting in a lot of commercial burglaries. And they went out to those, to those groups to see what they could do to make that a harder target, whether that's increased security or cameras or enhanced physical security. 
the the work they did out there correlated in time with a I think we're going to talk about it on the next slide with a nine percent drop in commercial burglary. So we think that was probably a success. The uh, they also have done a lot of investigative work. They've made 109 arrests uh, this year for burglary, theft, mail theft, firearms violations, narcotics violations, stolen vehicle possession. They've recovered $818,000 in stolen property. They've recovered 1,000 pieces of stolen mail, and some of which included uh, bills, ID cards, passports. They've shut down seven major fencing operations that were buying and selling stolen property inside the city of San Jose. Uh, those, those operations were shut down were in districts 3, 5, 7, 8, and 10. If you look at their, their, that proactive work, they've had several high-profile cases this year. The most recent one in August you may have seen in the paper was called Operation Kickstand. They, did a, they were after a seven-person burglary crew that had been operating in San Jose and the South Bay, and it had been hitting bike shops, construction sites, and even a school district office. We picked up on it through crime data analysis of, a, of the bicycle shop thefts. That's how we kind of focused in on this group, uh, hence the name. And the, uh, they served five search warrants, arrested seven people from that burglary crew, plus another four suspects. They located bicycles, generators, firearms, narcotics, and stolen IDs. And that's the photo you see in front of you is some of what we recovered uh, the day that we took uh, that crew off. So we're real happy with the work they've been doing. And in this time frame, since they started their work, we've seen a 9% drop in commercial burglaries, an 8% drop in residential burglaries and a 26% drop in school burglaries. Granted, the, the, the small number of events in school burglaries makes that number less reliable than the, the data set for the other two, which is a much larger data set. But if we have to argue that you know, the data set might be unreliable, I'd rather argue that 26% down might be unreliable than up. So we're really happy with these numbers. And, and so then I'll talk, kind of my last point here will be to introduce to you the the Justice Assistance Grant that we received from the Department of Justice. This is a grant that they offer to police law enforcement agencies to help prevent, control, and reduce crime or to apprehend criminal offenders. You can see a list of all sorts of things that we're able to use it for. We submitted our application in August of this year. Uh, there are certain conditions with that. One of those conditions is that it be reviewed by a governing body, which is why we brought that to you last year and why we brought it to you the year before, and, and here we are again. Uh, this year, the, the County of Santa Clara declined their portion. It's typically split between the city and the county. We have a written MOU with the county where they have decided they don't want their portion of it, which leaves us with $290,000 to spend out of this grant. So we're going to spend the first $124,000 on poll cameras. This isn't the exact model that we were looking at. This is just an example. And the idea is that it will be portable and allow us to do surveillance, uh, perhaps at special events. That's, that's the thing that's really motivating this, so that we can increase the security of our guardian, guardian program and add another layer of protection within that at special events. This will help us uh, provide protection at the event and also help direct resources in the event of an incident. We're going to spend 139000 buying some more Motorola uh, handheld radios. These are the radios that we have in service now. As we continue to grow, we find ourselves needing more of these. They are able to communicate across a number of different uh, radio bands and allows us to communicate with essentially any other law enforcement agency in the region. This, is, this comes in really handy when you go into critical events in other jurisdictions. Uh, it paid off uh, very well for us when we went down to the Christmas Park shooting recently and earlier in the summer when we were down helping Morgan Hill with the mass shooting that they had at a car dealership. So now uh, we're just gonna go ahead and increase the number of those that we have. Those also have a really neat um, GPS beacon that they can put out during an emergency when an officer is requesting emergency assistance. We're gonna dedicate 18,000 of this just towards grant management. That ultimately is one-tenth of, uh, of an analyst. And so that is where 18,000 is going. And the last 8,000 is 3% of the grant money. The, one of the conditions of the grant was that we increase our training and compliance with the uh, National Incident-Based Reporting System, which is a, a federal system for reporting crime out to the federal government. Uh, so we need to spend 3% 3 on that, and that is 
the uh, smallest portion of the grant. And that, ladies and gentlemen, leaves us at questions. Thank you very much. Um, I do have a number of speakers um, that have selected to, to speak on item one. I'm thinking you might want to speak on item two, but uh, if you're interested on, on item one, uh, I'll call you down. You can come down, and if you meant to list item two, then by all means you can do item two. So um, James Golding, Jennifer Hearn, Shannon Mira, Laura Wentling, and Barbara Liberty. Is everybody for item two, actually? Yes, okay, no worries. Okay, to my colleagues, any questions or comments? Yes. Uh, Vice Mayor Jones. Uh, yes, on the, um, for car break-ins, would that fall under larceny or burglary, or what would be the? Uh... For somebody breaking into a car or stealing a radio, for example, uh, California law would break that down into a burglary if the car was locked and into a larceny if the car was not locked. However, for reporting out to UCR, they, they, they consider those what they call car clouts, and those are all reported in the um, larceny section, I believe. And the reason why I ask that question, at least in my district, and I know that other districts throughout the city as well as throughout the area are, have uh, seen a, a rash of car break-ins where people smashed windows and yes, sir. steal a laptop or other personal items. Uh, is that re have, are the numbers that we're looking at now reflective of at least the feedback that we're getting from our residents in terms of this rash of break-ins? I haven't broken down you know, the, the larcenies into their subcomponents. Uh, but that would stand to reason that you, you've had reports of increases that activity and we're seeing increased larcenies, so. Because it's, it's, at least in my district, it's pretty significant. I, I, I even, I'm getting reports now almost daily of multiple break-ins of, uh, of cars at, at shopping centers throughout my district. And I don't know, hopefully there's a way for us to break that out because I'd like to one, see what the trend is specifically for, for car break-ins, and secondly, um, if it's being underreported. I, I fear it might be underreported because these things often are, uh, and as you can see from the work that our burglary prevention unit did this year, uh, being able to break down the data and figure out where the problems are really does enable us to take effective measures. So, you know, we always, when we go out to our community groups, are encouraging people to report, even if they feel like it can't be solved reporting it allows us to find the trends and direct our resources and we always encourage that. Great. Thank you. Yes, sir. Councilmember Arenas. Uh, thank you, Chair. I want to um, congratulate you on the, on the robbery numbers. I think when we have specialized units like the unit that you, that you all established last year, I, it's effective, right? Um, and so uh, it's, it's gone down quite a bit and so I really appreciate it. Um, I think all around uh, San Jose, it's not exclusive to District 8, but we um, definitely get our um, our string of uh, robberies, um, especially because we're at the furthest end of Foothill Division, and I know they know that it's harder to get to our part of the neck of the woods. Um, and so, so, so anyways, and, and I know the, the holidays are coming, so, so we, we're gonna probably see that go up a little bit, or, um, but I think your crime prevention unit is doing some excellent work in terms of um, connecting with our um, office to do some public uh, safety series, and and we target them to to seniors for identity theft, and you know um, some some communities for package theft. So I think in uh, in, in combination, all of these things are um, really harmonizing, really working together, and I think we're seeing the results of this, um, and so. I, I want to just uh, thank you for 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 those efforts, um, and I hope that you can relay this back to that particular unit. Um, we often don't get to recognize when there's um, good work happening, right? And I will make a point of being sure the unit commander hears that. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, th the next question I have is for um, this is this is the the. The report that we typically get on a bi-monthly basis, correct? And 
Um, I know I'm in our past uh, reports, we've included sexual assault because it was a request of mine to include sexual assault. Right now we only have rape um, numbers and I noticed that those have gone up a bit. Um, so I wanted to, to also ask about the sexual assault. Um, I, know, I don't know if maybe it was an oversight at this point, but typically um, you've brought in some numbers for sexual assault. Well, it, ma uh, my understanding is that in the last two or three, we were specifically asked to cover that uh, in, the, in the trends and status part of this report. Uh, we didn't receive a request to recover that in this particular committee meeting. Mm -hmm. We are doing a lot of work on that, and, yes. and we are going to be bringing that. out that informational memo that you requested shortly, I believe this month, uh, as well as a special meeting. So I did not... I did not know that was on the agenda for this oh, meeting. Okay, and I didn't know that we needed to request it. So, um, I wonder if we can embed it into uh, this kind of report, since you know there's a lot of work that's going to be um, that's currently being done and that will continue to, do, to be done by by the, our police department. I would love to see some of that progress um, reflected historically in our reports. And so, I'm not sure. Chair, if, if it's a request um, to you to continue to have these reports um, on an ongoing basis. Um, I appreciate that a lot of that information is going to come up really quick, and so I'm, I'm not too worried about that, and I know there's a lot of really good work that you are all doing um, in those areas, um, but I'd still like to continue to see these numbers on an ongoing basis. I understand. I'll reach out to the city manager's office, and we'll set up a protocol of some sort. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, that's the extent of, of my of my questions and thank comments. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. And I'm not certain how much you're aware historically, Lieutenant Cook, but I'll remind uh, my colleague yourself. We, we did shift up the model a little bit last year, where um, there was actually a lot of data being reported um, as, on a regular basis, and unfortunately, it wasn't all digestible. It wasn't all information that we actually dove into. And so we did shift the model to kind of through these crime trends and opportunities for individuals if they wanted to request particular data. That's, so that's where that's falling. And that's why, Council Member, it's, it's, we have requested it um, on a few occasions. We've gotten that. But it is not a, a, a standard now report that does come out. Um, but it is something that um, I think you know, we, we certainly have opportunities with the next joint meeting specifically on this. And um, it will be, I think, will not be left out, uh, but for the moment, uh, the new procedure is that we are sort of requesting individual um, statistics, um, you know, for each of these meetings ahead of time. So if you did want to see that, again, um, outside of the, the upcoming session we have, um, I think we can, we can easily add that in again, you know, so. And thank you. As always, we'll be happy to respond to anything that we're asked to bring to council or, or to the committee. We're happy to do that. Great. Thank you. Uh, if you don't mind going to slide six. So first off, uh, congratulations and really excited to, to see the success of the burglary prevention unit over this first year. Um, and to hear about the number of cases that they've been able to make and to see the, you know, the impact, at least so far, with the, the year one results. I'm curious, the data that you have here shows, for instance, burglary occurrences, 4539 for 2018. Um, and then when I look at the page four, um, burglary listed for 2018 was 2617, 2617. So what is the discrepancy there? Why are those different numbers? So what you're seeing in the 2018 number on slide six is all of the burglaries that occurred in the year of 2018. And then what you're seeing in the, I believe it is slide number four, yes. is you're seeing the burglaries that occurred in the months of January to July. Oh, okay. If I, if I read the title, I would yeah. notice that. So, oh. yeah, uh, that's all, quite all right. <laughs> so, the uh, January to July numbers are all we have available for 2019, and so for a, a, you know an apples to apples comparison, that's what we choose from the. That's why one. you did that. Yes, sir. Okay, got it. That was helpful. I was looking at the number, going, "Why is that off?" Now I know. I actually, I actually had that same moment when I was putting the slide together. So. Oh, good. Thank you. It's not just me. Um, okay, no, I, I really do think that you know that's. Um, you know, so far, 
so good, right? We'll, we'll, we'll see as it progresses. We'd love to see that trend, um, you know, start going the other way, right? Start trending downward over a number of years. And I think at that point, you can certainly attribute it to the, uh, the new burglary prevention unit. So, but so looking forward to that. The justice assistance grant, do you have any idea why the county would de decline that? I read the MOU that they signed with the city of San Jose. Um, and they said a lot of things in there except that one piece of information. And I, I could speculate, but I, but I would only be speculating, and I'm not No need to speculate. To, I was yeah, just I'm not kind of curious why, why somebody would turn down, you know, that yeah, rat. So. Yeah, I understand. They, they weren't explicit with us about why. Okay. Um, I, I have some assumptions, too. So, all right. Well, hopefully we can make good use of that um, as what it looks like there. So I don't have any other questions, no other uh, questions or comments from my colleagues, if we can get a motion to approve the report. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? None. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I didn't mention to anybody else who is in the room, if you did uh, want to speak on any of the items, you can fill out the yellow cards that are up here in the front, just set it in the box. Um, and. Um, and then you can speak on any of the items. So, and I do have a number of speakers for, the, for this item. So we have uh, item number 52, which is our uh, Police Department Recruitment Act, <coughs> excuse me, activity and a report. Welcome. Hi, good afternoon. Let me just make sure this works, we're good. Okay, my name is Todd Traer. I'm the Lieutenant in Charge of Recruiting and Backgrounds for San Jose Police Department. Today I'm going to cover recruiting for police officers and uh, especially focus on the communication positions toward the latter end of the presentation. My team continues to successfully recruit for the police department positions at colleges, junior colleges, career fairs, and through hosting mentorship events locally. There's a national trend being experienced, uh, being experienced throughout the country where applications are decreasing for law enforcement. This has been attributed to stronger economy and availability of jobs, as well as the decreased interest in law enforcement. Fortunately, SJPD continues to offer a great career opportunity. We've been able to continue hiring for all three police academies, as well as significantly increase our applicant pool for communications in the last fiscal year. We do that by uh, recruiting at criminal justice academies throughout California, focusing on communications and dispatch academies for recruiting, implementing partnerships, which I'll discuss a little bit later, and heavy social media outreach. People are asking how we're doing it. Agencies are coming to our department to ask us how we're doing it and contacting us from all over the country. We've been focusing on candidates that are likely to choose San Jose Police Department as a career. We recruit where great candidates hang out, which includes the colleges, police academies, and communication academies. We've updated our photos and we show real life activities that our recruiting unit is sponsoring. One of those was a Women's Career Day, which was really open to everyone. Both men and women came. It was highly successful. It attracted over 120 people. It was a full house of applicants and pot potential applicants which included a breakout session with our communications and records team. Here we have two of our latest four military advertisements. If you look closely, you'll see half of the uniform is military and the other half is San Jose Police Department. This has been a highly successful military campaign that we started. The photos are actual San Jose police officers that either served full time for the, for the uh, nation's military or were part of the reserves or ROTC. We continue to attend and host local events. Right now, half of my recruiting team is in New York, and I may have uh, just checked and we received about 81 applications in the last hour and a half, which is a tremendous amount. Same thing happened in Chicago last week, and throughout California, we continue to receive most of our applications. Now, all of the, event, the events not only promoted San Jose police officer jobs, but all jobs within the police department. This is a, uh, fo some of the photos from events we've handled at the police department, which include practice physical agilities, written test preparations, countless ride-alongs, 
oral board preparation classes, and mentoring like I don't think my team has ever done before. And this year we focused on really telling a story about our department. Our focus has been service over excitement. I would say when I got hired, it was really focused on the excitement of the job, where now applicants are looking for the service end of our job and how San Jose Police Department can facilitate that service. I think we can do it, and we are doing a great job through our powerful community connections. We continue to attract a very diverse group of heroes. These are the ethnicities that applicants elected to claim when they first get hired. As you can tell, 35% elect not to disclose. That number seems to be creeping up. I'm proud of the diversity our department is attracting. At this very moment, my recruiting team, returning from Chicago, um, went to five different venues, and I can tell you that at John Jay College right now in New York, they're also seeing a huge influx of people that want to live and work in San Jose. I'm going to go through every event on this chart. I'm kidding. <laughs> I won't do that to you. I won't do it, but I did pull down each event over the last fiscal year, and I wanted to uh, tell you my main takeaway from this is that personal recruiting leads to hands-on mentorship for these candidates. It's what works here. It doesn't happen everywhere else. It's what's getting people to stick with the San Jose Police Department. We phased out some of our events a lot of them were community events where they wanted the recruiting unit to hand out stickers, which I love, but we turned that over to patrol, and now the patrol units will go out to those events for a few hours and do that job instead of sending the recruiting unit out to a non-application uh, winning event. We now track our stats weekly. Every week I know exactly how far and how successful each event is. Um, I remember at our last meeting we talked about taking risks on some of the events. We still do that. Some of these events have been amazing. Some of them have been just events. We're using satellite recruiters now. And in this slide, uh, it talks a little bit about the different events where we've done that. But what we're doing is sending officers who went to certain schools to those schools, officers who are in the military to military events. We're just putting the right people in the right places. We started advertising through Viet TV, which is one of the largest Vietnamese television stations in our area. It's been highly successful at offering jobs to the Vietnamese community as well. We continue to reimagine our workshops and our videos, and then we post those videos online at a new website, which we just started at the last, the last meeting that we were in at the sjpdrecruit.com. It helps people get through the written test, the oral board test, and gives them a chance to experience some of the different testing processes and what to expect with our department. We're in the middle of developing a communications workshop to take the critical test. That is a, um, that can be a very difficult test and it seems to be that most people, when they come in and take that test, they do not pass it. So we're working on a workshop to help people prepare for that test. And finally on this slide, I, I wanna mention that we, are, we mentioned video oral boards last year and this year, we have fully implemented video oral boards for people who are outside of a 150-mile jurisdiction from our department, um, which right now it tends to be most people from New York and Chicago. I think the numbers look pretty good for police officers. In this slide, you can see we're at 58 p applicants that are um, potentially going to start in our October Academy in a few weeks. Uh, the reality is it'll probably, we'll probably lose some people as they finish the psychiatric and medical evaluations at the end. That's a very normal part, uh, percentage that we lose uh, that we can't predict. But right now, the number that we have hired is 58. And I'll show you what it looks like on a, the best graph I can do. Uh, we're heading the right direction. As you can see, the academy class that graduates tomorrow has, uh, I think, 39 people there that are going to graduate, but they started with 42. They started with a lot more, but uh, some people don't make it. 17 people have been hired through laterals and rehires, which is often bigger than many police academies over the last fiscal year. And 107 people left. Fortunately, most people that left, left because they retired, service retirements and um, you can see how it all adds up to the 107 for this fiscal year. So 
Okay. It's no surprise. We've, I, I did watch the, uh, the council meeting on September 10th to prepare for today. And we, uh, and I know you've spoken at depth in depth with staffing being low for communications, which is why we have an amazing crowd here today. We've implemented a plan to increase staffing and successfully hire our, we've successfully hired our largest cl class of yet. As I mentioned earlier, applications were up from 1310 to 2034 over 700, which I think is a 64% increase in applications. This is due to my recruiting team working with communications to increase attendance at South Bay Academy classes for recruiting, heavy social media pushes, and boost through our marketing company, Civilian Incorporated. Today, I wanna to talk to you about the plan for the future, the heavy, the heavy recruitment for communications, and the work that we're gonna to do together to help implement it. I've reviewed the city auditor's report, the civil grand jury's recommendations. I participated in both reports. First of all, our applications are now open year round instead of having cutoff dates that were confusing to applicants. You can apply to be a communications dispatcher anytime. We are doing heavy social media and our goal is to be number one through different search engines like Indeed and Google searches. That's what happens with the police department. It is highly successful and it's the reason why we get so many people clicking over to the application process for police. It needs to happen for communications. I hired more backgrounders because of the influx that we had and we're going to have. One new full-time backgrounder, one part-time backgrounder with additional hours, and then one completely new part-timer to help me with communications, applications, and backgrounds. We have a new partnership. The partnerships are with colleges, San Jose City College Communications, West Valley College Communications, and San Jose State University have all invited us to come recruit for their communications, for our communications job with them. The next one is really new. Um, I'm working with ROTC and the reserve program for the uh, Army, for the military, both. And it's a partnership that's gonna publicize our job openings to 19,000 people across the country who daily go and click on jobs and predominantly in California. As I mentioned earlier, we're creating a critical workshop um, there's a stigma with critical that if you've never taken it, you take it the first time, you're going to fail. So that, uh, and it does, it seems to be true. So our goal is to handle a critical workshop just like we do with a written test, what we call the pellet B. And my recruiting unit is putting together a class that it's gonna be free for the users to come and learn how to take that test and prepare for that test. I am going to hire back retired communications people for recruiting events instead of trying to take communications people off the floor and away from their jobs or the training people away from their jobs, we will hire back people who used to work here and are great recruiters and cheerleaders for our department and they're gonna help me on recruiting events within the state. The big one is pay. I saw the grand jury's report and their assessment of starting salaries for dispatchers and call takers. We were listed as the lowest in the survey. Higher pay realistically attracts applicants it helps us retain the people that we just hired and the new people will, and it'll also help us retain senior dispatchers at the police department. What we don't want is a lot of senior dispatchers either leaving or dropping down to part-time dispatchers so they aren't required to work mandatory overtime, which can happen and pay can be a big influencer of that happening with our department. It's critical that when we do look at pay, we look at workload for the agencies. I watched um, the September 10th uh, meeting, it was very powerful, and I did a little bit of Todd Traer math quickly on one agency. Just, we were compared to some agencies like Milpitas and we were compared to Campbell PD. Campbell Police Department has 35,000 calls last year. They have 10 dispatchers, they have nine. They're about to hire their 10th. We received San Jose Police Department received 1,035,000 calls in the same time period. We have 140 people, technically, that work within that unit. If you divide it, which those numbers don't work out quite right, but you can see that we are at over double the workload just from that. 
And I know those numbers aren't right. I know that I know they're going to be higher. But my point is, day to day, off, our dispatchers are doing at least twice as much, if not triple as much, depending on what city we compare to. I chose Campbell because it was way at the top for the pay. But the reality is, is we should be compared to Sunnyvale, to big city, cities that are paying more, and also cities that have similar workloads. I think we've been compared in that audit to cities that have very small workloads. I don't, I don't think that's fair. There's my Todd Schreier commentary. Thank you. As far as um, recruiting, we did update the, the recruiting information. The flyer has been distributed. It's out a lot more than it, I think it has ever been, especially through social media. And we're work, working with communications to streamline recruiting processes. It takes a long time to become a dispatcher. And the processes aren't the same. A lot of people compare it to becoming a police officer. It's different. The training is longer and necessarily so. But uh, someone who applied for a job in August to become a communications dispatcher, just applied in August, would not start their academy until August of next year. That's all I have. Thank you, Lieutenant. Appreciate that. Um, Joey, did you want to add anything in the presentation or? No, here for questions. I'd like to take a moment to thank Lieutenant Trayer for his work. I know that this was uh, involved and we certainly appreciate the support and for our staff coming in here to also provide support for the direction we're hoping this is going. Thank you. Okay, so we do have a number of public speakers. Uh, I'll call you down and uh, you can come down whatever order you'd like. We have uh, James Golding, Jennifer Hearn, uh, Shannon Mira, Laura Wentling, and then Barbara Liberty. When you come up, you can just state your name for the, the record. Thank you. Oh, yes, sorry. Yeah, you can come up here. Yeah. Uh, I apologize for my uh, lack of public speaking skills. I'm James Goulding. I've worked as a 911 dispatcher in San Jose for over 31 years. Um, so uh, 25, 27 years ago, there was a, a concert and a fight after a concert and turned into a riot in the city of Philadelphia. A lot of people were killed, unfortunately, dozens were injured. And afterwards, people were crying and saying, gosh, we called 911 and it, what happened? And so nationally, these, the tapes were played of those calls, and the calls were ignored, they were mishandled, it was terrible, uh, to the point that uh, it, it was a national outrage. Uh, ABC's Nightline uh, then did a special, a series, on the state of 911 in America, and it looked pretty grim. And then they came to San Jose and they said, we want to point out the best uh, dispatch center in the country. And that ended up being us. And they did a special on us and our rigorous training, our recruiting, our uh, top of the line technology. Anyway, we came out sparkling. Uh, I'm going to go forward a few years to uh, the tragedy of 9 11. And uh, <clears throat> when that happened, a lot of us, myself, rushed down to work. We came in on our days off. For the next two years, after that, we had people from Homeland Security saying, coming to us and saying, because of how well you guys are coordinated with other uh, agencies, uh, because of all the work you do, San Jose Communication Center is the most important building in, uh, in all of Northern California. Not San Francisco, not even Sacramento. Uh, San Jose, our, ours is the most important building in Northern California. So then we're gonna come forward a few more years to the disaster that was uh, Measure B. And it ended up uh, emasculating us to the point where a third of our dispatchers resigned. Why? Because they could go other places to smaller cities, do less work, get more pay. Uh, a lot has been made to uh, atone to the, the police department, and thank God they deserve it. They're overtaxed. But uh, we at Communications are currently and constantly working overtime. It was a great week for me, only 48 hours that I had to work this week, so I got to see my family a little bit more. Um, I guess the question is, uh, you know, not why did so many people leave, but why did so many of us stay? And I think it's, for me, I can't speak for everyone, for me, 
you know, I live here. More importantly, uh, my children live in this city, and my grandchildren live in this city, and I want them to have the safest, I'm good at my job, I want them to have the safest uh, environment they can. And Vice Mayor Jones, you are absolutely right. Uh, car clouts are way up. Uh, they're up in, well, I'm not sure where your district is, but good Lord, go shopping at Westgate Mall or go to Valley Fair Mall or go see one of our fine restaurants off Hostetter and Brokaw. I'll tell you tonight, your car is going to get broken into and they're going to steal your laptop and they're going to take your passports. And we're going to get a hundred of those calls tonight. We know it's going to happen. And those people, unfortunately, are going to be waiting on the phone for 20 minutes to say, hey, someone broke the window to my car. Uh, someone took my items. Their lives are wrecked. Now, it's not it's not a tragedy, you get over that sort of thing, but it paints a bad picture for our city, which used to be number one. We were the number one safest city in all of the country. James, I apologize for interrupting, and I, and I, I recognize this is probably your first time, so I, I, I didn't make mention of it. Everybody gets two minutes, it's totally fine. I, we want to be able to hear from you, um, but I'll have to ask you to, to, to wrap it up. Okay, so Thank sorry you. about that. No worries. Anyway, uh, yeah, let's make it a quality of life thing. People should have their phone. We used to answer the phones immediately. We do for 911. We set the national standard. Our, our 311 is, is fallen by the wayside because of recruiting, because of staffing, because we're underpaid. I myself had three recruits in recently. I'm doing a lot of recruiting for us. Uh, one of them got hired by Santa Clara, more pay, and two of them stayed in the public sector for more pay. So. Whatever makes our jobs better will make you guys better and will make the lives of hundreds of thousands of voters in San Jose better. Anyway, thanks for your time. Thank you. And just uh, for the record, Westgate Mall is in my district and that, that was one of the malls I was referring to. Yeah, it's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> it's across the street from the vice mayor's house actually, so. <laughs> Hello. Hi, if you don't mind introduce yourself and I'm sorry, I, I didn't mention that before, but. Um, That's okay. I'm, my name is Shannon Mira. I'm a, uh, I've been employed with the City of San Jose since 2002. I'm a public safety radio dispatcher. Um, my job is not a job that just anybody can do. It takes a great deal of time and training to become a skilled public radio dispatcher. Um, when I first started with San Jose, it was the place to be, it was the place to work. You know, we, could, we had so many people. I went a whole entire year without working any overtime. Um, when we had the economic crisis in the city of San Jose and we had to take a 10% pay cut, I had to switch my benefits to health and lieu so I could afford my mortgage payment. So now, because I do not carry benefits with the city, I'm penalized by my husband's employer because I don't have my own benefits that are offered through my work and I have to pay up to 40% of my own medical costs if I choose to go to the doctor. Since April of just this year alone, we've had mandatory overtime from 25 to 35 hours a month. This is not sustainable. I commute from Gilroy because I can't afford to live in San Jose. I have a family. Having to work so much overtime affects my health and my family. On a weekly basis due to overtime and commute, I work from 5.30 in the morning. I leave my house at 5.30 in the morning and I don't get home until 10 o'clock at night. I don't see my daughter, I don't see my husband. So not only does this working environment affect me personally, it affects my family. To get hired with San Jose, you receive excellent training People are getting going through the application process. Once they get hired, a trend that we seem to have is they're leaving to go to work with other cities that are smaller, less work, because they are paid more. Um, it's frustrating to feel that relief is on the way, and then it kind of falls by the wayside because it doesn't change. Without skilled dispatchers and call takers, the citizens of San Jose and the police officers are not able to get the help they need. People are exhausted from working Every week, 14 and a half hour shifts back to back. Studies show that people make mistakes because they're sleep deprived. Doing our job, we can't afford to make any mistakes but it could cost somebody their life. San Jose is the largest, safest city in Santa Clara County with the largest population. We have the highest call volume and we're in the middle of the Silicon Valley. The recent grand jury report, as you all know, indicated that we are the lowest paid in the county. I have not left for another agency because I have a strong loyalty to San Jose PD because it's where I made a career change to come to work here. Where I made more money in my other career, but I wanted to do something where I could give back. Now, I don't leave the city because I feel that you guys all have the ability to turn this around and get us back to where we should be. Thank you for your time. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Laura Wintling. I am not a 911 dispatcher. I'm just somebody that came to voice my concerns about what is going on. It breaks my heart to hear the last speaker and the working conditions that she faces and that you, you all know about. Um, I have nothing re but respect for the San Jose dispatchers. I don't know if ever, anybody has ever called 911 before, but if you're in a medical emergency and you hear their voice, it's instant relief that somebody is there to assist you. Last Saturday, I heard banging upstairs in my house, and I thought, oh my God, are we having an earthquake? What's going on? So I went out to investigate, and my 21-year-old daughter was having a full-blown seizure. I don't know if anybody's ever seen a seizure before, but they're very stiff, they're convulsing, they're foaming at the mouth, she lost bladder control, and I'm sorry I'm emotional about this. Um, she had been talking to her friend at the time, and the line was still open, so I said, please call 911. Um, she called me back a few minutes later. 911 didn't answer the phone. You got, um, you got a recorded message saying, please stay on the phone. Your call will be answered. I thought, I'm by myself with my daughter. I said, oh my God, I'm not calling pg e or Comcast waiting for a representative. I'm calling emergency services. What is going on? I'm alone in my house. She's upstairs. She's 21 years old. She's 5'4", 115 pounds. There's no way I can get her down the stairs by herself. I call my son, who's in Hollister. My husband's at work. Um, I didn't have anyone to help me. I call 911 myself. I get the recording on the phone. I'm like, what am I going to do? I call again. I get 911. I happen to know somebody who who was a dispatcher, who was a retired dispatcher, who was able to, by not calling 911, call and get somebody to help me. You have no idea the instant relief you feel when you're talking to somebody that can, that's more knowledgeable about your situation than you are and that can help you and guide you through the process. They were able to call, get an ambulance out there, but I waited a long time to get somebody out there to help her. She's unresponsive. She's unconscious. The paramedics at that time felt that it was necessary to take her to the hospital. This is intolerable. This is not okay for anybody to have to go through what I went through on Saturday and what my daughter went through. When she started, when she started coming to in the hospital, she said, God, if I would have been shot, I would have bled out, Mom. I would have died. She's under a neurologist's care, so you know, the neurologist has said to us, don't take, don't take this lightly. Seizures can cause comas and even death. So you need, to be, you need to be on this. You need to know what to do and what's going on. And oh my God, I need to be able to call 911 and get somebody to help me. And no one was there. And that's not okay. You guys know that this is a problem. You know that this is, this is a situation that's not new to you. You need to get these people some help so that they can do their job and do this properly. For me to be a taxpayer in the city of San Jose and to not be able to get help for my daughter is not okay. I work for the senior community. I work with seniors all the time. You know that they, come, they have medical emergencies. They have things happen. What am I supposed to tell my clients? I'm sorry, your mom is not breathing. I'm sorry, your mom is having a stroke right now. Just hang on the line. Somebody will get to you as soon as they can. That's not okay. This is not, this is not okay. I want you to fix this problem. I don't want you to fix it now. I don't want you to fix it next week or next month. I want you to fix it immediately. Because when I need help, or my, my clients need help, or my family or friends need help, they should be able to get it. And I'll tell you what, I've called 911 before, and they are excellent. And you should appreciate what they do every day. And these working conditions that they face in this mandatory overtime and the stress that they're put through, this not only affects their health, but it affects the community. Thank you, Laura. I have to... That's I, and that's well. fine, but I will not let this stand. So please take me seriously. If, this, if something isn't done, I will move on from here. Thank you.
tough to hear. <laughs> um, Susan. Okay. Put it together. Um, I'm a mom, so I get that. Uh, I'm also, my name is Jennifer Hearn. I'm also a supervising public safety dispatcher. First, I want to take time to say thank you so much for your support um, on the meeting last week. Um, not feeling like we have a voice within our own union, within our own department, is defeating. Uh, but to again feel heard, have some hope, um, it boosts morale. Uh, it helps us kind of reunite, reunite the fire into what we do. And this is what we do. We help save lives. Last meeting, you talked about the urgency of needing to resolve the staffing and retention issues due to us essentially being the first time, first contact with citizens, the first responders essentially. Since that meeting, I was aware of one dispatcher currently in the hiring process with another agency, uh, as well as talk of seven call takers being recruited or sought after by yet another agency. I have not confirmed this information, but if true, urgent is now. We need to fix this. We have all noticed the effort put forth rebuilding the police force and the special projects advertised to the public to cut crime, which is great. However, this has created enormous strain on the dispatch center without any thought. The more projects, the more citizen calls for help. We have more and more officers on the streets, but less and less dispatchers to support them. As it stands now, we often have one dispatcher working two channels as well as only four call takers assigned to take 911 calls for the city of a million people for a good part of the day. Poor people. And the ones we are have are trying to do so while tired and overworked. And I know that doesn't sound bad because everyone in the city is working more with less. But when you think of an officer coming up on the air screaming, he has just been shot, a mother calling 911 uh, for whatever reason, a child just committed suicide, they can't breathe, they're having a seizure, a call for a horrifying crime you only see in the news that we hear. You want your dispatcher on the ready, not on their 13th hour of the third day. The dispatchers have incredible tenacity and grit and they deserve to be paid and valued as much or as such, excuse me. These dispatchers sacrifice to take care of the community, they take care of your voters, they take care of you, and they take care of your families. But who is there to take care of them? And I hope it's you. So thank you, and thank you for the extra time. Thank you. And the last card I had was Barbara Liberty. Good afternoon, Council. Um, I am actually speaking on behalf of another dispatcher who is currently at work. I got to have my say last week, and thank you very much for showing your support. So this letter is from Laura Lopez. Um, please accept this letter as my personal account of a day in the life of a San Jose police dispatcher. The one thing we all have in common is the desire to have safe communities for the citizens of San Jose. Something we don't share common, something we don't share commonality on is the priority for the wellness of the workers that carry out the task. The San Jose Police Department is responsible for the majority of that task while the San Jose Police Communications Department is their foundation. In the 17 years I have worked for my department, my work week, workflow, home life, and overall physical wellness have taken a drastic turn. What once were four 10 hour days have now regularly become three 14 and a half hour days due to the overtime and staffing crisis we have been facing. I have two options, fulfill my overtime requirements on the days that I'm already at work to cut down on an additional gas and preserve my much needed three days off, or I relinquish a day off. It's a double-edged sword and I'm one of the fortunate employees that live relatively close, only 24 miles away, one way. My job as a police radio dispatcher has taken over the majority of my life, my work week, and with extensive overtime requirements typically allows for me to work and sleep only. I work watch four, 11.30 to 21.30. I add my required overtime to my shift from seven to 11.30. I wake up at 5.15, I start my commute at 6.15 and work until 21.30, which is 9.30 at night. Uh, I only to drive home, go to sleep and do it all again the next day. I have not touched upon the amount of meal preparation that's required since I will be at work for 14.5 hours. I have not, not touched on the two teenage daughters that I have that I'm raising as a single mother and the impact my absence has. I have not touched on my duties as a provider, a homemaker that have to take backseat to my career. 
when people hear about my job, my hours, and what my actual life really looks like, they often ask, why don't you just get another job? The answer isn't that simple. Being a police dispatcher is not a job. It's so much bigger than that. It was what I was meant to do with my life, and I know that because no matter how hard it is, no matter how difficult the calls, the violence, and the outcome are, there's no place I would rather be. I want to be on the other end of the radio when someone needs help because I know I'm capable of orchestrating the proper help to save a life, and that is who you should want on the end of your police channels and 911 lines. That type of commitment and mindset is not easily replaced. When I am asked what would improve the climate at work, the one thing I think most of my coworkers, myself and coworkers would be able to agree upon is to be treated with respect for our craft. The respect that starts with acknowledgement that our jobs are unique, vital, and, and necessity. That respect shows up when budgets are allotted for hiring and recruiting efforts um, are substantial. That respect shows up when our work environment is maintained, kept up to date with workstations and equipment that are meant to assist our wellness. I encourage you to take a closer look at the neighboring agency and their numbers. Did you know that a crew of your overworked, exhausted dispatchers and call takers went to relieve the Gilroy Command Post during their active shooter event at the Gilroy Garlic Festival? We assisted them for two days and were not excused from our own work shifts, commitments, and par provided mutual aid. The point of my letter is an attempt to give heartbeat to a faceless person. I hope this can serve as a reminder that we are not just voices. We are mothers, fathers, daughters, sons, husbands, and wives just like you. We value our homes, raising our children, and hopefully having some fun along the way. We are also proud of our jobs, our impact, and the legacies we leave. As a native of San Jose, a product of Evergreen Neighborhood and Silver Creek Valley High School, there's no other city I would rather serve. This is my home where my childhood memories live, where I was shaped into the woman and mother that I am today. This is the community I want to give back to. Respectfully, Laura Lopez, Public Safety Radio Dispatcher. Thank you for letting me go over. Thank you. Anybody else that didn't turn in a card that wishes to speak? Okay, seeing none. Um, I will turn it over to my colleagues first. So, um, anybody would like Vice Mayor Jones? Yeah, well, you know, first of all, from uh, it's is really um, heart wrenching. Actually, is the only word I can come up with in terms of what our dispatchers and call takers are, are going through and your experience and how the impact the impact that it has on on your quality of life and and the fact that. Um, you know, when I think of uh, 911 call takers, I put them in the same category as nurses and teachers and police officers. There are angels. And I had a situation where I had to call 911. And getting hearing that voice on the other side of the phone definitely gives you a sense of comfort in knowing that something's going to happen that's, you know, someone's there for you. So I hear everything that was said. And I know that from the previous uh, council meeting, that there's a strong desire to, to do something. So we're looking at two different uh, paths. One is a short-term path and one is a long-term path. It's very clear that there's a need to do something in the short term. And I don't have the answers to it, but I, I definitely want to hear from staff in terms of what we can do or what's in our power to do in the short term to provide some relief and then work on a long-term strategy. So I'm gonna, I don't have a, a question, I'm just throwing it out there and I wanna hear from my colleagues and from staff in terms of what, we, what are the next steps. City Manager's Office. So I, I think it, as the police department put, it is this a multifaceted problem and I think they hit the nail on the head. We've gotta hit the recruitment, we've gotta get these audit recommendations implemented to help with the workload and we do need to look at the pay. So we will be going into closed session very soon uh, within the next couple of few weeks. Um, I know employee relations is working on uh, doing some research and, and to prepare for that. So you'll be, you'll be hearing from the, the administration very shortly in the closed session on the pay issue. But in the meantime, I know that uh, they're trying to work on some of the, the, uh, the city auditor's recommendations on the workload related to some of the non-emergency calls and pulling them off to help at least as fast as they can on some of the workload issues. But it is that, uh, very complex problem, and it's it's hitting ahead here, and uh, and we we're we're taking this seriously from multi, it's not just an easy solution on, on one thing. We've got to hit it from def, different angles. Thank you. Um, I think I'll I'll 
save a couple questions myself for afterwards to follow up on it. Councilmember Dennis. Thank you. So um, I saw that in your report you have in, you have ten rehires and and you, I heard you say that the rehires are for um, recruitment. Is that is that right? The ten rehires are officers that left the department and went to a different department and then have come back. Mm -hmm. and, but they're being utilized for recruitment or um, to help ease some of the workload? Uh, no, the officers are used on uh, patrol cars on the streets. Oh, okay. That was for the recruitment in general. That wasn't for the recruitment um, for, for the dispatchers. Um, I think I got my wires crossed there. I thought there was some some recruit some rehires that you were you had mentioned in the communication division. Yes, there are um, there are people in communications who have either retired. Most of the rehires are, I believe, people who have retired and come back and work part time for communications. And wh what are those folks? How many of those folks are there? Are, there, are they? And what are they being utilized for? We do um, what we, we call it per diem, but it's the part-time unbenefited and then the retiree rehire, and that they're used um, in their job classifications that they left at. So some have come back as call takers, radio dispatchers. We also tried a pilot project with some personnel who had left many years ago um, and weren't familiar with our current phone and CAD system. They come back and they're doing um, only track reports, so they're just assigned to track. So we have them various duties mm -hmm. that they were doing before. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, the the reason for the question is because I, I, I heard our um, deputy city manager and I know that that um, that is going to take a couple of weeks for us to and probably more for us to uh, get this the the pay issue um, uh, ball rolling right. But in the meantime, I, I you know my my heart goes out to 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 all of you. And I thank you for your service. I know that it's probably, I don't know if I could do your job. I just don't know. Maybe I just fall to pieces listening to folks being in crisis. It's hard. It's hard, it's hard to interact with folks who, who are in, in that um, situation. And so, so I, you know, and I recognize this in our September 10th meeting that uh, this is, this is a, Typically, a female-dominated field, right? And with that comes, and you know, I think in in the letter that we heard from Laura, um, I think it was Lopez or uh, Miss Lopez. Um, she talks about being a single parent and and being absent in her own home. And I and I I also acknowledge that asking all of our dispatchers to work so long, we're creating uh, more expenses for them, right? We're ex asking them to not be at home, so be at work, um, probably. And with that comes child care, right? And, and it's not like we're paying for the child care um, or after school care or whatever it is or whatever program that, that, that maybe they use. I'm a working mom, so I have an after school um, care program for my son until maybe it'll pick him up. Um, but I, so I would like to see some additional um, uh, some of these fringe benefits um, also discussed um, so that they can have some some sort of ease, some sort of relief from the work that they are doing. Um, we, we are not acknowledging some, some of those expenses that they're making because we're asking them to stay. And because we've heard that they want to stay because this is the, the job, this is their role, they, they, they have a purpose with this, and, and thank God you do because um, I think it takes a special person to do this work. So aside from this discussion about pay, I'd also like for us to, to include in that some of those those benefits that will help re relieve some of the current dispatchers um, and some of those expenses that they're making in their daily lives to be at work and, and not to get paid enough to, to make ends meet. So, you know, I, I, I could see why some people would leave because they're, we're creating more expenses from, for them rather than, than um, salary increase. So I, you know, I just want to, I, I know that um, because Jennifer is here, she's heard us, she's going to make sure, I know she's very diligent about these issues. 
speaking from experience, because we worked together on some of the uh, other issues, I know that it, it's, in, it's in her court, and I know she'll get this, this ruling for sure. And, uh, and I was actually going to mention that this week we just approved for the engineers, um, for the planning department, we increased some um, salary uh, increases. And so we have a crisis on our hands uh, in terms of our housing. And we, we do have a crisis in our hands in terms of this communications um, department because it is a big problem um, when, when your daughter is, is suffering from a medical condition and you haven't had the opportunity to connect with 911. It just, you know, th these, these are not just stories. This is the reality of our residents. And unfortunately, these are the, the lowest um, th these are crises, right? These are where, where we, 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 when we interact, it really matters. And so I want us to make sure that um, we, we're on track with, with the 311 and, and making sure that we, we're diverting some of those calls. And so that was part of my question. Where are we with, with that? Um, I know our plan was to to divert some of those 911 calls or 311 calls so that they can go into the uh, call center, customer center, rather than bog down the, the system. How, how is that going? So there's currently an RFP process that's getting ready to wrap up for a consultant to come in and do all the metrics and look at what calls should be transferred over and how we're going to manage the transition and the rebranding of 311 as an all city services number. I believe that process uh, will wrap up on Monday. It's being handled by City IT with the goal of having 311 transferred over uh, by January of 2020. Um, I certainly think that this mm -hmm. will definitely help, but I do feel that a large majority of those calls will still come back to the center. The current phone tree is a way for people to sort of self-direct. And so now people who just go ahead and press zero come to us, whereas over the call center, they'll be able to filter those out. But non-emergency calls are still going to wind up coming back to our center. And I do think the key, I think you're absolutely correct, um, it's, a, it's a big fear. I think the key is we've got to look at the staffing on the IT call center side too, because if they have big weights over there, then we're just defeated the entire right. purpose. So that's something that Rob, will be, Rob um, our IT director, will be mm -hmm. monitoring, but that's very, we're very aware of that, because I think that's an absolutely real issue. Right, we're just rerouting the problem, and, and now people who are calling the customer care service will have to like sidestep our system and and they're they're going to need to know somebody who works there to be able to connect with them and you know that's just they're going to get frustrated the, the you know the residents are going to get frustrated and they'll just call right back and so right. it's got to be we've got to educate people and we also have to be staff so the call answering time is reasonable on their end uh, great so this is to me this is very alarming that that we're having medical um emergencies and and you we that I hear that our residents have to sidestep the system that we have in place in order to actually get medical care to me is very alarming. Um, I want us to make sure that, you know, that it doesn't take a couple of weeks to get this in front of us in closed session, but as quickly as we can, because these are, these are medical emergencies. These are just all crises that are, that are, um, that our dispatchers are dealing with. And, you know, they need that relief. Um, more than anything, um, they need to make sure that they're paying their bills on time. Um, so, so for me, that's absolutely important, but it doesn't answer the question about that their relief system. So I'd like to see um, what additional measures you, you're taking to have additional rehires or how are, the, the police department did quite a different, a couple of different strategies in order to to bulk up again, right? We did the rehiring, we uh, transitioned some folks from administrative so that they can go out into the field. Um, so I'd like for us to continue to think about how to, uh, what additional strategies that we are going to um, implement to make sure that the, these the dispatchers have some sort of relief um, because the pay issue is one thing, but the relief is the other. And, you know, um, I could see how appealing another job could be somewhere else for a lot less um, uh, calls and, and more salary. And I want us to make sure that we invest in, in, in our dispatchers now and that they get the relief that they, that they deserve. Thank you. That's where we're
Yeah, I just have a few comments. I, first and foremost, thank you so much for the recruitment info. I, I think it, uh, it bodes well for the future of the department to see a consistent sort of rise of, of uh, interest from applicants and, and to the residents that want to consistently see more officers on the street, which I think is a good thing. You guys are doing an awesome job. Um, with regard to the issues around the dispatchers, I, I think it was um, some of the speakers, uh, several of the speakers really, uh, <laughs> as you probably could tell, we're tugging at our heartstrings. I, I think, um, you know, we as a city venture down many paths doing a lot of creative things. Um, I often, you know, have expressed and, and, and believe that if we're not getting these basics right, right, someone answering the call when you call 911, um, people living in the streets, uh, enough police officers, these, these basic things that I think that the city is, is obligated, I think, uh, to, 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 to do for its residents, I, I think we're failing. And so, um, as you were talking about, uh, uh, you know, calling 911 and effectively being put, in, put on hold, I, I think that is a very clear sign to me that uh, we, we, we've, um, let this go for far too long, and uh, and I, I do want to just echo some of the comments that were made by my uh, colleague uh, Silvia Arenas, in that um, you know we, we we consistently invest resources in in, in certain departments that we think uh, are are you know important for one reason or another, and and I don't see how we can possibly in any way see this any different, um, and so I, I just want to let you know that. You've been heard, and, and that when we discuss this in closed session, uh, I suspect that you're going to have a, uh, a good uh, amount of folks on your side uh, really trying to figure this out once and for all so we can get moving in the right direction because, um, you know, I, I, I don't think um, anyone desires, especially you, uh, to have a place where essentially you are being the lifeline for the officer, for the callers. Um, and, and, and when you're not doing well, I think it speaks to the city not doing well. And so uh, thank you so much for coming. We very much appreciate it. And, and uh, I want to let you know that you've been heard. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. And I'll echo some of the sentiments as well. And so first off, thank you to our public safety uh, call takers and dispatchers for taking your time to come out today. Uh, it's specifically um, why, although I was not certain how many people would be able to show up, but. Uh, Specifically why I wanted to have this included in today's update, um, knowing that we've had some great success uh, on uh, recruiting and hiring and retention of our officers. Um, that has been the focus and these, these regular updates uh, were much different a number of years ago. And uh, we've certainly turned the corner and you know, and so thank you to your efforts for that as well, Lieutenant. Um, but what has not gotten the attention that it, you know, has deserved has been with our, our call takers and our dispatchers. And so that was the intent. Uh, and so thank you, Joey, as well, for um, being willing to participate and be here today, but more importantly, for our own uh, employees. And I'll tell you, um, you know, that's, that is one that, as you've heard, um, certainly it, it, it hits on a personal level. These are, um, these are things that we all, as residents, um, you know, at times, um, Councilmember Carrasco was just telling me as well, being put on hold, being asked to, to be put on hold when she had called 911, the feeling of, of, of that. Um, I got frustrated being on hold for 311, uh, well actually just having it ring and ring and ring, but I, I have not had that, that sentiment. I have not called 911 and had to be put on hold. I can't imagine, but thank you, Laura, for your, your story because um, that is something nobody should go through and we all can agree on that regardless of who you are. Um, you know, a basic service like 911, uh, an emergency response. Um, our community members, we all deserve to be able to call 911 and have somebody there uh, that's not on their third day on their 13th hour to have somebody that's there that's, that's you know, ready to go, excited to help us, um, you know, wanting to, to connect us with the services um, that we need in a, in a crisis. And so uh, I appreciate you coming out as well um, to speak up. I will. Uh, you know, sort of just give kudos again in regards to the, the efforts. I know that the focus has been on the, you know, on the uh, sort of the critiquing end, um, which is where I'll focus the rest of my, my comments. But I do just want to echo, right, I think it's great what, what we've been able to achieve. Uh, and I appreciate, Lieutenant Dreher, that, that some of these creative efforts and how we're, um, the simple things like keeping the application 
period open all year round, right? Just the things that we may not think about that make a huge difference. Uh, so I appreciate, I do appreciate that. Um, so I'll, I'll now move to some of the, the main focus and the sort of critique and uh, um, Joey and others have heard it. Uh, and thank you, Lieutenant, for watching the video. Um, you know, I expressed my sentiment uh, when we also re received or when we were returning our report to the grand jury report. Um, so it's going to echo a lot of those, but some things were brought up here that I want to talk about, and I see Jennifer Shembury in the audience, so I'm going to invite you down, uh, and you can enter the panel. Uh, it might be a bit of a ring battle, um, because uh, Lieutenant Treyer made a mention of regards to something he felt wasn't necessarily fair, which was the comparison that we did with the smaller cities that may not have a similar workload, and so I just wanted to see if you... Um, had a response in that regards. I know we are coming to closed session, um, and this is in no way, Jennifer, trying to like pick on you or anything, right? I mean, we're trying to solve a problem here by all means, um, and really appreciate your, you know, sort of ability to to, to do what you do um, in uh, employee relations and being able to, to to help us in these regards. And um, and and part of it, though, it sounds like there there was something, and I, I kind of sense that too, right? That there's. Maybe not an apples to apples comparison. So maybe if you can just speak to that. And I don't know if Lieutenant Trayer afterwards you wanted to elaborate, but. Sure. Um, Jennifer Shembury, Director of Employee Relations and Human Resources. Um, so the what Lieutenant Trayer was referencing, I think the specific example was Campbell. We actually don't compare to Campbell. So the grand jury report was comparing to Campbell. So I think you may have been critiquing the grand jury's salary survey, not the city of San Jose's. Um, so the jurisdictions, though, that we use are um, comparable classifications in cities and counties in Santa Clara, San Mateo, Contra Costa, San Francisco, serving populations of 100,000 or more. And so we do that to try to get larger agencies, even though there are some agencies in there that are a lot smaller than San Jose, but we definitely try to get the bigger agencies versus Campbell or Los Altos. Um, and that is actually an agreement we have with the union. So that's in the union contract, so we can't deviate from that. Um, and it is Article 22 in the MEF contract. Uh, there are some occasions where we may deviate if we don't have um, a lot of comparable agencies. So a good example is when we did the community service officers. Not a lot of those agencies have CSOs, so we did deviate from that. But otherwise, that's our standard agencies that we survey um, pursuant to our agreement with, with MEF. I appreciate that description. Um, Lieutenant Trayer mentioned, and he did bring up Campbell, but what he did was sort of some simple math, right, of, of just looking at the, the workload as well. I know that I think our comparison really only looked at the pay, right? Um, is it possible that we can also look at uh, doing some simple math on workload, especially prior to coming to closed session? Um, that is possible. It's not something we usually do. We do just look at pay. Even when we were looking at police officers and other agencies, we stuck to kind of our comparable jurisdictions and didn't look at workload. Um, it's not I would have to think about how we would do that um, and what the right way to do that is, but that's not something we typically do. It sounds like, Lieutenant Trey, you just did, you, you I'm assuming you, you got this data somewhere. Was that from the grand jury report where you got the number of calls or did you get that somewhere else? I, I got the San Jose data from Joey. Us, yeah. And then um, the Campbell PD puts out a report like to their council also, which is where I received their report. Okay, so it's public information. Public information. Yeah. Okay, I, I would love to, Jennifer, before we come to close session, I'd love to have that uh, uh, along with the comparisons of the salary, just so we can see a better apples to apples, even if it's, we're not going to say it's perfect, but it's sort of back of the napkin math, right, where we look at, here's what their general staffing looks like, staffing numbers, and then here's their call volume, and you can asterisk right, right, the disclaimer of saying this is right, not necessarily um, exact and similar to what Lieutenant Trayer said. But I think that would be very helpful because I think that's, and I talked about this when we, uh, in the, the council session, we're kind of stuck in a really bad spot right now where, right, we're, we could be spending a lot of effort and energy on uh, recruitment right now, but it takes quite a while, right, as you stated, to, to go through that process, to get hired, to get onboarded, to finish all the training, the academy. Um, and, and we're so, at the moment, we're so understaffed and overworked that we're, we're losing people, right, at the same time and at times quicker, as we're hearing, right, than we're even able to bring people on board. And that's what I was mentioning during the council meeting that I said, I don't even know if even a dollar amount today would actually 
be the total solution. We might today say, let's offer, let's be top, top of the, the, you know, the Bay Area or, or the, the Santa Clara County, let's say, and that might not do it today because we still have this extreme amount of, you know, sort of workload difference. And so I did have a question for uh, Jennifer Weir, Assistant City Manager. The short-term solution, I, I think that we have at least our idea of a long-term solution. We have this idea, we're coming to closed session, we may be able to address this, um, you know, with pay and recruitment efforts. But I think that we have to really have a, a keen focus on what we're going to do in the short term um, to make a difference or else what I feel like is all of these will, efforts will be in vain and that we're just going to literally kind of keep cycling through. Um, and so I'd like to see, and I'm going to give a couple examples or ideas. Mm -hmm. We have, I think, um, and Joey, tell me if uh, it's 35, 40 hours mandatory right now a, a month that, right? About that's what's yeah. Going. It can vary for the different classifications, but that's probably about average. Yes. Um, I'm curious if one, do we have a limit? Right? Is there whether it's in the union contract, right, or elsewhere? Is there a hey? Is there a cap, right? Or would we literally work people, you know, an extra 40 hours a week, right? Is there no cap? So I'm I'm curious. One, is there a cap? And then two, um, what do we do if we actually hit a number, whether we have a cap or not? A number that we would agree upon that we say, okay, we, this is, people are working too much, knowing that we can't wait a year and a half, right, till more people, bodies come on board. Is there another solution? Is there something in the short term that you do? Do you bring on, you know, temporary help? Do you, um, like what we did to go relieve uh, in Gilroy, right? Is there, I, I'm just kind of curious in those regards. So this is all around the short term solution. Yeah, and I don't know if, if you can speak to it, but I, I absolutely agree there, that have, we have to have this multi-pronged approach to this. Um, the, um, I mean, I, I really am thankful to the city auditor's office for doing that recent audit because it gives a, 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 a place to go to start doing some changes with the workload because there were several recommendations in there um, that we need to look at, and I know they're getting on it, and they are trying to, by January, I know that Rob Lloyd is really trying to work with them on at least something, and we've got to continue to hit at it, so that it has to be uh, taken seriously, which I know they are. I do, they did, you did do a double time, Jennifer, what was the, with overtime, uh, in the, what, what are we doing with, um, with the overtime? So we count paid leave towards the calculation of overtime okay. for dispatchers. Okay, that's what we did. Okay, um, so I don't. I'd have to look to um, the police department to maybe talk about some of. The, I know you've done a lot of different strategies to try to um, manage and not burn everybody out. And I know you're always on a fine line with that, on a very thin margin. But I don't know how you might want to describe how you do manage the overtime, just to give a sense to the committee, and. Um, and then if you don't mind answering the first question, I saw Jennifer Shembry shaking her head no, that there is no max number of, of overtime hours. Yeah, and that as well. In the MOA. In the MOA, there is no I don't know that you, I don't know you how don't they have manage it. Part. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So when we do the overtime, if we're going to go in a mandatory, we want mandatory over 14 hours in a day. So if an employee's worked already 10 hours, we stop at um, another four and a half hours. But as far as what we consider the the, the bidded overtime, we go through and we look at existing vacancies that we already know we have, and we'll tell people the targets are 30 hours and they have to bid on that. That does not account for last minute overtime where they can still get tapped on top of what they've already bid the 30 hours. Um, we try, we know there's a big psychological number. There are a lot of times when we could have gone to 40 hours of predicted overtime, but we know that that's, um, to, to ask people to work a whole nother work week is really, asking way too much. So we, we try not to ever Can go I pause you there, Joey, real quick? Do we actually, is there, is there a scientific number behind this? I'm imagining there is somewhere that like says at a certain number of hours, right? Like you're, you're literally, right, now less useful, right, or harmful. So do we know this? Or I'm, I'm anybody really at this point. So I'm kind of curious. So it sounds like, I don't know, it sounds like you guys have something internally, but I am curious if we're, if any of this is, you know, is there a hard, fast number that we're going to say, yeah, we're, we're, we need to stay under that? So There's no hard, fast number that I'm aware of. I, I honestly think anything over 10 hours is probably too much, especially with the call volume that our staff is handling right now. It's call to call to call to call. There's no time down in between to maybe process what you just heard or did. So it is a taxing 10 hours. So to put time on top of that 
is too much already. Um, we don't know of any true study to say this is where you should draw the line. Uh, we feel going out and asking for 40 hours of um, bidded overtime is just uh, a psychological defeat to everybody because that's a whole nother week. Um, and I know that they're working that on already with in addition to the bidded overtime in the last minute when somebody calls in sick that day and you have to get tapped to stay, they're already working well in excess of that. So we don't like to ask for that. Um, we do try to do all the things we can to prevent the overtime. We have great supervisory staff that still has the skill set to go down and work on the floor. We've tried simulcasting the channels longer, which means work harder, but avo avoid some overtime. We are not going to be able to sustain that with the amount of officers that have been put back out to the field. We can't continue to simulcast in the morning. So unfortunately, that's going to make more overtime. And can I clarify my previous answer on how we pay overtime? So, Jennifer, you were correct. So we do pay, um, we treat all paid time off with the exception of sick leave as time worked for the purposes of determining overtime eligibility, and we do pay double time for hours worked over 12 yeah, for I dispatchers. Thought, I thought I was remember, I was, was hoping I was correct, but um, so we did make that change in, in, in recognition of the time. And so obviously- And that was you know, a recent change, right? That we, not, not too, too long ago? Uh, probably in the last couple years. Uh, I don't have the exact date, though. Okay. So as the police department, you know, really has obviously stepped up the recruiting efforts and we're shrinking, hopefully, the vacancies. So not only do we have to deal with how many, besides on the workload and trying to, you know, get the non-emergency calls off and other things and maybe better technology or what have you, we also need to then, once we can get them, get them actually filled, and obviously there's training time, my vision would be that then we need to reassess how many dispatchers do we need, obviously, to correspond with the increasing population mm -hmm. and in the increasing, hopefully, rebuild of the police department. And then I, I think we need to get to a higher head program, which we've never done in my uh, career here with the city. Mm -hmm. But it's been a goal that I think we've talked about, but we've never been able to hit that. And obviously, we're just go hopefully going to be starting that this year with the police officers yeah. because of the long training time. We need to anticipate retirements. We need to anticipate vacancies and, and start hiring ahead so we don't, that will help with the workload too. Because once you start having those vacancies again, then the workload starts building and the overtime starts building. So it becomes a vicious cycle again. So it, it, again, we got to deal with the recruitment and then the retention, the pay, the workload, and everything else. So we got, we have to hit it from all the angles. But I hope before I retire, we can get, and I've, you know, I've got 28 years and we can get to some sort of, um, Higher ahead program eventually with this program because it's definitely right for it. Thank you, uh, Lieutenant Trey. You wanted to add something? I I just wanted to add something real quick on the workload. I went out. I went and uh, added the nine one one calls and three one one calls. That does not include officer initiated action in the street, which must be a hundred thousand. I, I don't know, but it's a it's a much bigger number. Can we calculate that number or no? Do we have that? Um, I don't have it available now, but I do have my PMR. Our total so that call, is something we can, we can... Yeah, but what the PMR does not include is um, calls to the service desk or the bridge, as well as outbound calls. So we know that there's uh, a whole other workload that's not being captured, and we get hang-up calls, abandoned calls, callers that are disconnected, in which we have, we're having to call those callers back. Mm -hmm. So all that is not included in the call volume that he cited. Do you know, Lieutenant Trey, if that was included in the Campbell report? I don't know, but if we are going to compare those numbers, I wanted to make sure I, I mentioned that there is officer workflow, which is, you know, with more officers out now, it's, it's significant. If anything, like you said, it's just worse. It's not, it's, right. not that, it's not that the number's off and it's going to get better. It's that we're, we're off and we're, it's Correct. actually worse. Um, so in a quick, like literally right now, quick Google search, um, so I'm not going to say that this is 100% factual. We all know about using the internet for things, but um, this is a from a medical research talking about um, more than 10 hours of work in a day associated a 60% jump in cardiovascular issues, um, production decreasing after 50 hours of work every week, um, just a number of different like where. I think there are some statistics is going to be my guess out there and some actual data and reports um, that could help uh, us to determine that. If it's not too much trouble, Jennifer and I will do some of the, the research myself, but I, I wouldn't be hurtful before the closed session if also we can kind of look at some of that because if we don't have 
any sort of, you know, red line number that says, hey, we're not going to go above this, or if we go beyond this in overtime, you know, we, we have to you know, do something different. We can't just continue down this same path. Um, I think it'd be helpful to know because, and, and to thank you for um, Jennifer McGuire for mentioning, right, the, the importance of things like higher ahead. And I know um, Chief is here and really excited that we have been able to now uh, approve that for our police department because we have so much of the turnover with, um, you know, just officers that are retiring, right, the general attrition. And if you don't ever really catch up, right, you, know, you sort of have the, the, the hires ready to go and you know they're going to be on board in about a year and then you just lose more people. And so you, you sort of get stuck in that rut. Um, and that's, you know, and then we end up staying in this, this vicious cycle, um, which, I, you know, we've heard it today. We haven't heard it in, in this regard, though. Uh, I don't think at this, um, at this body or even at the council with this many individuals um, coming. To, uh, to come and speak up. So I just want to echo again all the appreciation from us here on the council. Um, unfortunately, we are not going to, to Laura's point about solving it today, we're, we're not going to be able to solve it today. Um, this, is, this is going to take uh, more time than any of us want it to take, um, but I'm looking forward to the closed session meeting and then reporting out on that. Uh, my office, and as well as I know the city manager's office, but my office personally will, will uh, stay in contact with individuals like Joey to make sure that you are aware of what it is that we're able to achieve out of these uh, closed session conversations, and then you'll hear that through the union as well in regards to what you know what it is that that the offers that are be coming forward or what it is that we'll be doing for both the short term and uh, the long term. Uh, I'll just leave my yes. I I, I have to I have to. Um, ask you, we can't engage like this. I'm happy to engage afterwards, ma'am. Um, so, but I just want to say thank you to our, uh, our city employees um, for the work that you put in day in and day out. Um, I was working my once monthly reserve shift this past weekend on Sunday and, um, and was surprised at how long the channels were simulcast. Um, and I don't know what on the back end was making that happen. Um, but I'll tell you, it's certainly, um, you know, from an officer's viewpoint, um, what our call takers and dispatchers do for us, um, you know, we, we could not do the jobs that we do. Um, and it, it's, you know, it's been great to see the improvement within the police department, but it is extremely discouraging to, to not see our call takers and dispatchers uh, right there along with us. And so thank you for, for that and your participation. Um, and look forward to the closed session hearing. Councilman Jimenez, yeah, go for it. I just have one question, and I, and I, it's probably a silly question, <laughs> but uh, mandatory, mandatory overtime, right? Obviously, the word mandatory says to me that you tell an employee you're required to work X number of hours, right, which is totally clear to me. But what I'm curious about is what happens if an employee says, you know what, this is too much, I can't do it. I, I can't, I, I can't feasibly just, be here mentally, whatever it means, what happens then? Um, yeah, it can be a challenge. Um, we try everything within our means to try not to force somebody to stay. We'll, we have an overtime page that we send out. Um, we check all kinds of different options for this. And once we get down to it, and we tell somebody they have to stay, if they absolutely refuse, it can result in a personnel matter because then somebody else may have to step up and take right. it and so you right. can't keep tapping the same people over and over so it is a challenge and one that we luckily don't cross too often but it has happened before um, unfortunately okay and, and i guess a question for you jennifer uh, if in the, in the most recent uh, bargaining union contract for this particular bargaining unit w w it was mandatory overtime addressed in there and i'm not sure if we're getting into closed session stuff but it's just a, a general question though it's uh, we didn't have anything in the agreement related to mandatory overtime whether or not it came up at the bargaining table i don't okay. recall but it could have okay so so even if it doesn't reside within the agreement it's something that's uh, allowable because the position seen is so important or I'm, i guess i'm curious what allows for the requirement of mandatory overtime, is, is it? So it doesn't have to be in the agreement to oh. require overtime. As long as we're paying someone to do the work, um, we can mandatory them to do it. Okay. All right, thank you. 
Uh, I did think of one more question, sorry. And this came actually from Laura's comments. Can we also gather the data, maybe Joey, you can help with this, on how often people are actually placed on hold in calling 911? Or no? So it's, it's not that they're really placed on hold. They get a recording um, and it's picked up in the order that it's received. So if you call. So it's through, a recording. It's, it's a, a recording. So they're not being placed on hold. As soon as we can get we them. Can we tally that? How long somebody is sort of on hold with the recording before a you know, human picks up the phone? Through the ECAT system, which is a state um, database that manage, that tracks all the call statistics, uh, we can show what the longest answering times are. So you can see the percentage of calls, how many are answered with one to 10 seconds, 10 to 20 seconds, we can pull that data. Okay, and I believe some of that obviously was analyzed in the grand jury report, but can you also provide some of that data? I'd like to see that within the closed session as well. Jennifer. Yes, thank absolutely. You. Okay, okay, uh, thank you all for the discussion. Uh, we do need a uh, motion uh, to accept the report. Motion to accept. We have all kinds of motion. A motion to Councilmember Carrasco and second to Jimenez. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Thank you very much. We will now move on to item D3, which are we going to hear D3 and D4 together? We, we would like to if, if it's acceptable to you. Yep. So we'll hear items D3 and D4 together. Our card room compliance with Title 16 and then the impact of card room gambling and the uh, uh, annual crime or crime annual report. Welcome. Good afternoon, my name is Kirill Yermanov, Acting Gaming Administrator. Sitting with me is Nathan Chang, he is the Acting Sergeant at the Division of Gaming Control. Uh, today we are presenting to you two reports, Cardroom Compliance with Title 16 of the San Jose Municipal Code and an impact of Cardroom Gambling on Crime Report that covers the fiscal year 2018-2019. The Cardroom Compliance Report should give you an overall picture of what the Division of Gaming Control is doing and to what extent the card rooms are in compliance with various gaming regulations. Uh, the report is straightforward. It gives you a background as to what the Division of Gaming Control is charged to do, along with an analysis with respect to the regulatory program itself. And in that analysis section, we pointed out to you the number of work permits and licenses that were issued, as well as various compliance reviews completed during the fiscal year 2018-2019. The overall report is that the card rooms are in compliance with Title 16 and have been cooperative throughout the year. And And now I would like to move on to the second part of our presentation and talk about the impact of card room gambling on crime. Calls for service are calls that come into the dispatch center requesting or requiring dispatch of patrol unit. Reported incidents are incidents in which a report is generated by a member of a public or a police officer. The police department received 185 calls for service from Bay 101 Casino and 200 from Casino Matrix during last fiscal year. For Bay 101 Casino, 58 calls resulted in reports being made by civilians or by law enforcement. And for Casino Matrix, 94 of the 200 calls resulted in the reports being made. Of the reported incidents, only nine arrests were made for Bay 101 Casino and 11 arrests were made at Casino Matrix. Gambling crimes have a direct nexus to gaming, such as underage gaming. None of the arrests were made for gambling crimes during last fiscal year. Majority of the arrests involve battery, assault, counterfeit currency, drunken public, DUI, embezzlement, forgery, hit and run, narcotics, and trespassing. And we are now available to answer any questions you may have in regards to these two reports. Thank you very much. We don't have any public speakers on this. Any questions, comments from my colleagues? No, no. Seeing none. Um, I did have one unique one, and this is not necessarily uh, within 
it is within Title 16, but not necessarily on the report that you have here. Um, but there was something that we had uh, maybe like a year ago it came up in, and this may not even be for yourself, maybe more for a city manager or city attorney, um, within a, a conversation around um, city employees, specifically I believe even just elected officials or individuals like yourself that are in charge of enforcement of the card rooms, um, that for instance, it would be a code of ethics violation to even have dinner or lunch um, in one of the card rooms. And so I wanted to see if there was um, a sort of an, a historical understanding of that or the actual relevance of that as far as am I, am I misinterpreting it or so. Uh, and I'm sorry, I did not prompt you with this, uh, <laughs> with this question. It's uh, chapter 16.46.010. Uh, of, of Title 16, and it's listed in the Code of Ethics there. So what I'll do is I'll flag this for our city attorney's office. If you I could peek into that, I know that we only get this this report um, annually, so there's not really like many opportunities to kind of, and, and when I was looking it over, I was, you know, kind of, I know it had come up sort of jokingly in conversation amongst the council members in a closed session meeting, but I really wanted to have an understanding of that. So. Sure, so that I understand the um, question, the, your desire is to have the history of that particular code section as to why it was enacted. Yeah, or yes, my, my actual desire would be able to eat lunch at one of the casinos, but um, <laughs> apparently if I understand the code of ethics correctly, that would be a violation. So, um, th so yes, the, the deeper understanding is, is, am I interpreting that correctly? Is, are those violations? What is the history of, of those violations? You know, was there something I'm not seeing here that right that that caused that to, to come to fruition? Uh, Most laws, as we know, right, some something happened bad and then it got created. Or there was a desire to prevent something bad. Or desire, yeah. yeah. So that I'd love to see that. Did you hear that? So what? The, so yeah, we can get back to you on that. Great. And we're actually going to be going into closed session soon on Title 16. Uh, oh, great. Soon again as a follow up to the other issues, and so that maybe that place. would be a great place to talk about oh, that. Great. Maybe we can order from one of the restaurants there. Okay. So we don't have any other comments or questions. Thank you very much for both reports. So we will need a, a motion on uh, both of the items. Move to approve the report. Second. We have a motion uh, and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? None. Both motions passed. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then we have our last item of the day. Uh, item D5, our procurement card uh, expenditures audit report. Good afternoon, uh, Joe Roy, City Auger. I'm here to present our audit of procurement cards, clarification on policies, and additional oversight can improve the P-Card program. Um, here with Gitanjali Mandrakar from my office, as well as Julia Cooper from Finance, uh, John Cicerelli from PRNS, and Jennifer Chang, also from Finance. In the audience is Juan Baragan and Shirley Wong from my office who worked on the audit. The City of San Jose has a procurement card program or a P-card program whereby some city staff are issued Visa P-cards for routine purchases. The purpose of the program is to streamline the acquisition of small dollar uh, goods and services. The overall program is overseen by the Finance Department, but oversight for transactions is decentralized to city departments. The City's P-card policy spells out rules for P-card usage and outlines roles and responsibilities for management of the program. For example, cardholders are expected to retain receipts from their purchases, and departments also have approving officials who oversee purchases within their departments. In fiscal year 2018-19, roughly 999 or 990 cardholders across the city made over 50,000 P-card purchases totaling $14 million. The objective of this audit was to review P-card usage across the city. 
We've conducted regular audits of PCAR transactions since 2006, most recently in 2014. To complete our audit work, audit staff reviewed over 4,000 PCAR transactions that occurred between May and June of 2018, spread across all city departments. We had three findings. The first finding was that most PCAR transactions complied with city policy. However, policy clarifications for some types of purchases are needed. While our review of PCAR transactions showed that most adhered to the city's PCAR policy, some exceptions were observed. These included recurring purchases of water for personal use, technology purchases made without approval from the IT department, and others. Many of the exceptions observed had also been seen in prior audits and are the subject of open audit recommendations. We also noted that several former city employees had active P cards after their separation date from the city, and that many P card holders did not complete a required annual recertification quiz. I want to note that of those individuals who, who had separated from the city, we did not see actually activity on the cards, but it is policy to, to uh, close those cards. We have two recommendations to address those issues. Lastly, because city employees must be aware of and comply with many different city policies and internal guidelines for P card purchases, the administration should clarify some policies and make them more easily accessible for city staff in an easy, user-friendly format. Our second finding is that the city can better monitor expenditures for commonly used vendors. Finance no negotiates with various vendors to receive preferred pricing and terms. Since 2007-8, Office Depot has had an agreement with the city to provide preferred, pr preferred pricing, discounts, and volume rebates for office supplies. However, it appears that the city did not correctly receive all of the outlined benefits of the, of the agreements. From July 2014 to June of 2018, we estimate that the impact from those lost rebates and discounts may have been at least $176,000. We recommend that finance work with Office Depot to correct past issues and develop a process to better oversee the agreement with Office Depot in the future. Additionally, finance, finance has established open purchase orders that provide com competitive pricing for, or other incentives with other uh, vendors. However, PCAR data show that these have not always been used by city staff. Finally, because there have been significant levels of purchases with other vendors, including Amazon and Home Depot, there may be an opportunity to explore preferred pricing in terms with those vendors. Our last finding is that the Parks, Recreation, Neighborhood Services Department, or PRNS, can strengthen oversight of its PCAR program. PRNS provides San Jose residents with diverse services, such as operating and maintaining community centers, parks, and trails, and providing a wide range of programs to San Jose restaurant residents. The department's P card purchases reflect those diverse services. In 2018-19, PRNS had the most P card expenditures in the city, accounting for about 25% of total P card purchases. In addition, PRNS had the most P card holders in the city. Similar to the citywide transaction review, we noted that some P card purchases in PRNS did not comply with city policies. In addition, PRNS incurred $13,000 in late payment fees. Because of the volume of activity, the large number of P-card holders, and the dispersion of programming across the city, we recommend that PRNS reevaluate the number of P-cards needed in the department and develop internal guidelines for P-card usage to help staff comply with city policies. The report includes nine recommendations. I would like to thank the Departments of Finance, PRNS, Public Works, IT, and others for their time and insight during the audit process. The administration has reviewed the report, and the response is shown on the yellow pages of the, of the report. And we're happy to answer any questions. And I'll now turn it over to Julia and John. Thank you, Joe. Um, committee members, um, again, we thank the auditor for his audit of the PCARD program. It's one of those audits that's done on a periodic basis. Um, we're happy to see that some of the issues that have arisen in prior audits are not evident in this audit, which means that the processes and procedures that we put in place as a result of prior audits are, are working. Um, and we agree with all the recommendations. They've all been green lighted, and we expect most of those audit recommendations to be implemented within the current fiscal year. So, with that, John, did you have any? So, John and I are available along with Joe to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. I don't have any uh, comment cards. Any questions or comments from my colleagues? Nope, seeing none. I'll just say um, I apologize for the times that I've uh, purchased something I shouldn't, and I have to reimburse it with my own credit card uh, so but uh, thank you for not necessarily highlighting that in the audit report all right uh, thank you very much for the report uh, I appreciate it uh, if we can get a motion and a second to approve it and this is being cross-referenced to the full council 
October 8th. October 8th. Thank you very much, Joe. Okay. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? None. Motion passes. Thank you. We have no speakers for public comment. We are adjourned.